because I think I might have left a lot of people kind of totally confused. It's like, what if, where, what are we talking about? Hmm? So what we'll do is I'm having, I have uh, two examples, okay? How do we express all C A R C C I S professors are cool, okay? When the for all operator applies to everything in the universe, all the planets, all the you know, stars, and all the particles and whatnot, okay? So that seems to be kind of like, Ugh, how do we do that? Because every time you use the for all symbol, you know, the inverted A symbol, it basically says everything in the universe, it applies to everything. Well, whatever the expression is, applies to everything. And then the second one is how do we express at least one CIS professor is cool? Uh, that's probably the Iraj. Um, when the there exist operator also applies to everything. So these are the challenges because I want to talk about the filtering mechanism and then from there we can go back and talk about the big operator uh, you know, which is kind of symbolically talk, speaking, it is confusing, but conceptually speaking, it is a very cool idea to be able to define all of those things in a recursive way. So do we have any questions or concerns or whatnot you know, before I get started? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on and address you know, maybe the first one first. Okay, so this is the first one. So we are going to also you know, define a predicate. Um, do you guys still remember what is a predicate? Function that returns that is true or false. It's just a function that returns true or false. Okay, very good. So we are going to define the predicate. Okay, so if for those of you who, load, who know you know, uh, C++, you know, we can use a Boolean type, and we just call this your know, P, you know, and then we have a variable X here. Now, there's no type for x, you know, lowercase x, because, you know, it applies universally. So, you know, it, is, it has to be a very generic type. Potential. So, what it returns, okay? It simply returns this, okay? Returns is x cool. Okay? And that's all it does. Okay? It returns true or false if x is indeed cool. And I'm not even going to define what cool is, okay? Um, then it returns true. And if x is not cool, then it returns false. Are we good so far? All right. So the challenge that we have is the universe consists of a lot of things. And part of some of those things are ARC, CIS professors, and most are not, right? So we have you know, CI, ARC math professors. We have students, and then we have you know, you know, other many other things in the entire universe. So how can we um, come up with a statement where you know it is specifically only addressing a you know just CIS professors? Okay. So we'll start with a notation you know like this for all x, p of x. So this is basically saying everything in the universe is cool. Does, is that asking the same thing as, you know, are all ARC professors cool? No, because this one is also asking, is tax card the Miata cool? Yes, it is. Okay? But it also does say that all ARC professors, CIS professors are cool. Yes. <laughs> uh, it will also ask, you know, is, um, you know, that, you know, park bench out there cool? No, not really. I think that's a lot of graffiti, you know, painting, whatnot. Okay, so in other words, you know, that is not what we want. We want to like narrow down to just ARC, CIS professors. Are we good so far? All right. So in in some in a sense, okay, you can also look at what we want, okay, as you know, as a big or statement. In other words, you know, we are asking uh, P of tech. Um, okay, this one is a conjunction. Sorry, I, I take it back. So P of tag and P of Iraj and P of Ryan and P of Takashan, right? You know, and P of Damon and blah, 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 okay? And there are only so many CIS professors at ARC so this conjunction, even though it is long, it is definitely 
very much finite, okay? Because there are only like nine of us. Are we good so far? So if this entire conjunction is true, then yes, we can say all ARC CIS professors are cool. Does that make sense? All right. So, but I cannot, it's not easy to say that because the for all symbol, okay, the for all symbol right here applies to everything in the universe. In other words, we are also including a whole bunch of other things that do not make sense, okay? So in other words, it will also say and P of, you know, things that really does not, the cool does not even apply to those things. Um, I'm just trying to think of something, the moon. Next. Textbooks, okay, uh, or the, the planets, you know, Mars, okay. Okay, I got to tell you this joke. I know I'm getting distracted. I'm distracting myself. <clears throat> Some of you may have heard of the book called uh, "Men Are from Mars, Women Are from Venus," okay, and "Tech is from Cybertron." <laughs> Okay, some of you are getting the joke and some of you are not. That's okay. That is okay. And P of, um, give me something that is definitely not cool. Homework. Hmm? Homework. Homework. Okay. Tests. Quizzes. But it has to be a specific one, okay? You know, we'll, we'll just say, you know, C-I-S-P 400 homework. 440 homework. One. Okay. And blah, 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 okay? Well, that statement is unlikely to be true because it is having such a long conjunction of which you know, we are applying P to a lot of things that are not cool. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, we cannot just ignore you know, everything in the universe that are not ARC CIS professors because that is how the for all, how the... Uh, quantifiers work, okay? It is applied to everything. So what we want to do is to say, hmm, for things that really do not apply, turn it to a true. For things that do not apply, turn it to a true, and so on. Is that okay? Because true is the identity of conjunction. I have just spoken a bunch of words where you understand each one individually, but together in this context, what does that mean? Let me say that one more time. True is the identity of conjunction. What does that mean? Yes. Uh, something and true, uh, whenever that becomes true, uh, that something has to be true. And vice versa, true and something is something. Yes. And that part has to do with conjunction being commutative, so you're switching the order does not matter. Okay, so I just told you a statement that I claim is true, which is, you know, true is the identity of conjunction. So are you just going to sit here and go like, yeah, whatever Tax says, I think we can trust him? Yep. There are counter examples <laughs> to show that, you know, even without intention, I can give you wrong information, okay? Meaning that I can be the greatest spy in the world because the lie detector does not apply to me. So where's your headquarters? Um, I think it's over there and it turns out to be the wrong address. And I don't even have to try to give out wrong, wrong information. So no, the answer is no, you cannot trust me. So how do you check that? How do you know that, oh, okay, so is true actually the identity of conjunction? How do you know that? You have the tools to do it already. Yes? The truth table. The truth table, very good. Okay, so let's take a look at the truth table. I know I'm digressing a little bit here. But it is important. This digression is important because I want to help you guys build up the, um, the know-how of you know, applying what you have learned already and use that to validate claims that I would make without any proofs. Okay, so the truth table of AND is pretty easy uh, because you know, X can be false, X can be true, Y can be false or true, why can be false or true. So this is the, these are the four rows that we have to deal with. And we already know the truth table. It is in the notes. So there should be no need to write this down. But if you want to, that's fine too. It's a pretty easy table to look at. So looking at this table, how can we just look at this table 
and validate the claim that I made earlier, which is true is the identity of conjunction. Now, in this case, I need color coding because I am only focusing on two rows at a time. Okay. So I'll use, um, let's see, red. Okay. So we'll focus on um, Uh, I can focus on these two first. Okay, so we are focus on focusing on this row and this row here, and I say that this answers half of the question, because based on these two rows, I can see literally I can see that true and whatever is just that whatever. Does that make sense to you? Because true and false is false, true and true is true. Okay, so it works in one way. What about the other way? Whatever and true is just a whatever. So this time, let me pick out a different color. And let's see. Right, there we go. So we'll pick green this time. So this time, we're going to look at this one. Something and true. And also this one here, which is also something and true. So if you only focus on the green ones, the first one says, False and true is false. Okay, we get our whatever back. And then the second one, which is also, you know, which is doubly used you know, in this example, is true and true is also true. So now we have the definitive proof that true is indeed the identity of conjunction. Are we good so far? All right. But why is that important? Okay, I call this a digression, but it's not really that much of a digression, because I that okay. This is that's the reason why I want to turn everything like this. The p predicate applied to things that really do not matter. I want all of those p of something to be true, because you know as as long as those things are true, they would not interfere with the actual answer that I need. Are we good so far? All right. So now I'll give you the next you know, the problem in a slightly different format. I will define a set. Mm, let me see. I'll call it set A for ARC. Okay. So set A is uh, basically the uh, all the CIS professors at in ARC. Okay. So that would be uh, Brian. I mean the same list of people. Tag. Iraj, Kakashine, uh, Damon. Those are the ones that you are more familiar with, but we have a whole bunch of other ones like Larry um, and so on. But this is a limited list. This is a finite list. So we'll define um, set A like so. Okay, I'm using the wrong color, but that's okay. I'm not going to go back and change anything at this point. Okay. So these are the professors, and I want to create a statement where it is really asking uh, all AIs, ARC CIS professors cool, okay? So it would still have you know, this symbol because it, we still need the universally quantified quantifier, the universal quantifier, because we are looking for a you know, conjunction of a lot of things, okay? So that, that part is unavoidable. What we can do is inside the parentheses, it still needs to contain p of x here because um, we still have to evaluate, is x cool? So it is also unavoidable. What we can do, okay, you can see that I left out some room over here because that is, you know, we can add something within the parentheses that will turn, um, Whenever X is something that is not applicable, when X is a professor from, say, CRC, then we go like, okay, you are not from ARC, you know, we are not considering whether you are cool or not. Whether you are cool or not should not affect the answer here. So what, what, what should we do? Now, we, we probably, you guys probably already figure out that it might have something to do with this first, okay? Whether X is a is an ARC professor. That is probably important. That's probably why we define the set A, right? The question is, what operator do I use to connect X is an element of A and P of X? What do I use in between? 
The word and in this case is not conjunction. It simply means you know, those, those are the two things that are inside the parentheses, but we need something. We need an operator to connect them. So what operator do you think is applicable here? Hat. Hmm? Hat. The hat. The hat. The, it's called a cap. Oh, is it? No, no, no. I take it back. It's the wedge. Okay. So you're talking about the wedge here. So the wedge won't work because you know, for anything that is not an ARC professor, the first, uh, the left hand side is going to be false, which means the entire thing is going to be false. Now, because this is a for all, which means if the um, expression inside the parentheses is false for one thing in the entire universe, then the quantified statement is going to be false already. So you got the right idea, but the polarity is like opposite to what we need. So what other operators do you think we should use? Yep. Implies. Implies. Yes. So implication is the operator to use. Why do we want to use the operator, you know, like the implication operator? The implication operator says if the left-hand side, which is also called the precedent, is false, then the implication itself is guaranteed true. So that means when I, when I go through everything in the entire universe and X turns out to be bound to something that is not an ARC professor, then the implication is automatically true, which is what we want, because true is the identity of conjunction. And the for all statement is a gigantic conjunction of P applied to, or whatever in the parentheses, is applied to everything in the entire universe. So this makes it possible to basically say, as long well, if we're dealing with something that is not an ARC professor or in the set A, we'll just say, eh, okay? You know, the identity value for conjunction, it is only when X is really an element of A, then we go like, oh, the left-hand side of the implication is true. So now the actual truth value of the implication relies solely on what is on the right-hand side, which is P of X in this case. So in this case, the, um, the left-hand side of the implication can also be seen as a guard condition. In other words, if X is not a member of A, don't even bother to apply the predicate. So it, it can also be seen as a guard condition, which I hope you guys are familiar with because the guard condition is the way that we can go through a loop you know, to look for something and then exit early when that thing is found. Okay. How many people are not familiar with the guard condition, the concept of a guard condition? Okay. I will uh, divert. I, I, I will uh, digress a little bit to talk about the guard condition because you know, it is an important concept. You know, to know what is a guard condition. So I'm digressing just a little bit here. So let's just say that I'm, I'm doing linear search. Okay, um, we have an array A. Okay, so we'll say array array A has n items. Because in C++, you do not know the length of an array. As a property of the array, you really have to explicitly state the actual length of the array. So n is the actual length of the array. And we want to look for item k. And okay, k is the key that we are searching for. And the array is, whether it's sorted or not, doesn't matter. We, I just want to do a linear search. Okay. And let's assume it's not sorted, okay? Because you know, if it is sorted, you know, there, there are faster ways to do it. Let's say it's not sorted, okay? So one way to do this is to initialize your know, i, which is the index variable to zero. And then we say while, in parentheses, we say while i is less than n, and end, a bracket i um, does not equal to, K, and the only thing we want to do is to increment i to move on and look at the next element. So, you know, when the whole loop is done, it can exit for one of two reasons, right? One, how do we exit this loop? 
the loop itself, to the condition of the loop itself, is a conjunction, which means both sides of the, of the conjunction need to be true to stay in the loop, which also means in order to get out of the loop, if at least one side is false, we are out. That's how we get out of the loop. But depending on which side is false, the outcome is different. Okay, so let's take a look at the two possible ways for this loop to exit. So after it exits, um, if i is still less than n, what does it mean? The loop has exited already, but the condition i is less than n is still true. So that means i is not less than n is not the reason we exited the loop, which means a bracket i equals to k has to be the reason that we exited the loop, right? So that means this one means, you know, we found it. We found k. So the other one is i is no longer less than n, okay? I know it's going to be equal to n, but we'll just say it's not less than n. So in this case, what can possibly cause um, i is less than n being false, which means i is now greater than or equal to n? We have looked through the entire array, and the right-hand side of the conjunction never became true, which means I have just confirmed k is not anywhere in the array. So in this case, we conclude, you know, k is not in the array. So that's how a linear search algorithm can be written, okay, a really simple stuff. So getting back to the guard condition, i is less than n is also called a guard condition in this case. Why? Because of short-circuited evaluation. Okay, so I hope you guys have all come across this term. It's either called the short-circuited evaluation of Boolean operators, or you can call it the lazy evaluation. Okay, so I have seen textbooks referring to it in both ways, okay, in either way. So what that means is if i is less than n is false, I don't even bother to look at the second or the right-hand side of the conjunction. Now, you may think, oh, you're just you're trying to speed up something. It's, other than that, it is not important. But it is important because if i is not less than n, which means i is greater than or equal to n, a bracket i is now referring to something that is outside of the array it should have generated a, an index out of bound error for programming languages that would actually check that. Does that make sense? So that's why in this context, the condition i is less than n is also a guard condition to make sure that we do not try to access elements that are not in an array. Is that okay? Cool, okay, all right. So now getting back, so this is the digression. But it does relate to what we want to do, because in this case, x is an element of A is also a guard condition, because P of x is evaluating whether x is cool or not. What if it does not apply to whatever x we are, we are examining? This particular photon, is it cool? It's like, why would you call a photon cool or not? It does not apply. You have a type mismatch error. Well, with this construct, we would never have to have worry about that. We would never have to worry about that problem because the only time we would evaluate P of X is when X is indeed an element of A. It is a person, and so we can evaluate whether that person is cool or not. Do we have any questions about this? No questions? Okay. So this is one way to write it. Okay, it is the it's it would get the job done. But we also write it in a slightly different way. Most of the time, I would write it as you know, for all x in A, and then put p of x here. That's how. That's the way that I would usually write it, because this makes it a little bit more concise. We know where x is coming from. In other words, I put the um, restriction of where, what type of element really matters in this case. I make it very obvious and not using the implication operator like the uh, left-hand side of the triple equal you know, symbol. Yes? How do you call the treated i? Hmm? The is equivalent to? The yeah, is equivalent to. 
it just means you know, they are basically the same thing. For those of you who do not want to you know, look at a new symbol, let's we use something that we know already, if and only if. Are we good here? So now we have addressed the problem with the universal quantifier. What about the existential quantifier? Okay. So let's say the um, the district your know, chancellor says, well, okay, you know, apparently I have to lower my standard. If at least one professor in the CIS department is cool, I will still give you this little award here. <laughs> okay. Then how do we express that? So there exists x, p of x. Well, that's going to be true, probably because I know of a lot of cool professors working at our sister colleges, at UC Davis, right, at UC Berkeley, at Sac State, and so on, but they have nothing to do with ARC. I mean, they, are, they do not, they're not eligible to get the prize of, you know, you know being awarded when, you know, those professors are cool. So this is not the best way to do it, right? Because what this is really asking is this question, a whole bunch of ors, okay? It is asking P of tech, or P of Iraj, or P of Damon, or blah, 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 and you know, everything in the entire universe. So this would also include people who are not, or things that are not ARC CIS professors. So it would also include P of Phil, who is a math professor at ARC. Um, it would also include a P of, okay, tell me your favorite professor, a professor that who, who you think is cool, that is not ARC, CIS. Barcelos. <laughs> uh, hmm? Barcelos. Barcelos, okay. So Bar, Anthony, yeah. Tony. So we just say Tony here, or blah, 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 okay. So most likely than not, okay, this statement for all, there exists X in the entire universe such that X is cool, is going to be true, okay? So we now want to cross out the things that do not matter, that should not matter in the question that we want to ask, which is, is there at least one cool ARC CIS professor, okay? So we look at this list here and go like, uh, we, want, we want to cross this out, we want to cross that out, and so on. Well, so-called crossing out in this case is to turn all of these into false. Because as it turns out, when even, uh, just like true is the identity of conjunction, false is the identity of the identity of disjunction. I'm not gonna go through the proof, okay? But for those of you who want to exercise and go like, I want to kind of be able to use the truth table and observe and prove and validate that false is the identity of disjunction. It's the same approach as what we did earlier. It's a slightly different truth table, but the reasoning would still be the same. So I do recommend that you guys give it a try, okay? You know, after class, you know, when you guys you know, kind of sit down and talk about things, do give it a try, but I'm just gonna claim that false is the identity of disjunction. You can say or false as many times as you want, it won't change the value of that Boolean expression. Are we good so far? Okay. So borrowing the approach that we you know, that we used earlier, that means we cannot avoid using this, and we cannot avoid using this, and we also need to somehow make use of. Um, oh, okay. We were not using e. We were using x. There we go. So we will also we also need to include this. The only question is what operator should we use? We want to say, hey, if you're not a member of A, let's make it false. And? Hmm? Yeah, conjunction. Very good. So this time it is conjunction. Conjunction will work because now the element in X is an element of A, serves as, once again, a guard condition. But in this case, because it is a conjunction, it means if X is not an element of A, don't bother to write the value in the right-hand side because the conjunction is guaranteed false anyway. 
And as a result, we are now also looking at x is an element of A as a guard condition, because if that condition is false, don't bother with the other side. The whole thing is going to be false, which is the identity of this junction, which also means A. If you're evaluating, if X is something that is not a professor, an ARC CIS professor, we'll just pretend that we did not evaluate it. So that we can focus on just ARC CIS professors. Is that okay so far? Okay. So now we can say, okay, the, the other way to say this is for all x in A, P of x, but there, sorry, I misspoke, there exists x in set A such that P of x is true. So this way we have a way to focus and basically say, where is this x coming from? Well, it has to be coming from this set over here because for everything else, it wouldn't change the result of the uh, quantified statement. All right, is that working out okay? I'm not actually joking. I think uh, the red your program needs to have one specific class just for me. <laughs> But there's a reason why you know I talk about these topics in this particular way. Yes. So um, you said that for the uh, at least one of the criteria is cool. So if x uh, is the end of a is false, so don't bother with p of x, right? In this case, yeah, in, in both this. cases, yes. But the default value that it returns is different. When you have a conjunction, then quote unquote the default value when x is not from a is false. When you have implication, the default value to be, that will return when x is not in A is true. In this case, okay, let me use a mouse pointer here, okay? So in this case, if x is not from A, then the default value or the value it returns is false because this is false to begin with and this is a conjunction if at least one side of the conjunction is false, the whole thing is false, so this entire thing is false, okay? In the previous one, if x is not in A, this entire thing is false, but this is an implication. In an implication, if the left-hand side is false, the implication is true. And if that is not pounded in your head right now, then we got to do some more pounding. Because the implication operator is used basically throughout this entire semester. And if you cannot, if you are not quite getting, you know, or do not remember how it is defined, it is time to do some more pounding. Because guess what? We have a super long weekend. Next Monday is a holiday. The campus is closed. So that would be a perfect day to do some more pounding. Pound, pound, pound. Yes. You are basically asking about the truth table of implication. And where do we find that? From the first tables. Hopefully in your own notes, because I said, you know, okay, keep all the definitions at one place, right? But failing that, okay, it should be in the first module. It's the first module that we did last Monday. Because I specifically recorded the syllabus discussion into a video recording, so I don't have to go through that. So I can save that one hour. So it is important, okay? That stuff is really, really important because we build things on top of each other in this class and basically in all of my classes really quickly. So the scaffolding needs to be done, and I cannot do the scaffolding for you. You, you guys have to kind of spend some time and make sure that you read, understand the material. Just reading is not enough, okay? You a lot of people say, I understand it. Okay, so you can regurgitate it. You know where to find it, but that doesn't mean that you understand it. Understanding is making connections between the concepts, and that's a, it's, it's really hard to explain, you know, how to understand, you know, something, 
um, until you get into something like this. Okay, can you apply what you have learned and under and make connections to this new concept? So that's basically what that is. Whew. Okay, so are we okay so far with the existential quantifier that restricts to a certain set, and also the universal quantifier that restricts to a certain set? Hopefully, yes. Okay, all right. Now there will be times, okay, I guarantee you there will be times that you listen to me talking about something, you look at how it did in the board, you go like, I think for the most part I understand it. But there is a little bit of things that is gnawing at me. It's like, I'm not quite getting that. So what do you do in that situation? You let it eat at you and you just never... Hmm? So you let it eat at you and you just never... Address it? Yeah, never address <laughs> it. Uh, that, that, that's one way to proceed. That's a decision. Uh, you have a few ways to you know, proceed. One is ask me in class right away. It's like, okay, I'm not quite getting that. And you know, the formulation of the question itself oftentimes will answer your own question. I'm not kidding you. Okay? I have many cases where a student will raise their hand and go like, okay, go ahead and ask the question. And then a student will go like, never mind, I got it. <laughs> because when you're formulating a question, the way your, your mind has to work to formulate the question, oftentimes is enough to make that connection that, is, that was missing. So by the time you got the question, it's like, oh, I think I just answered my own question with my own question. And if that is not the case, then I would know what the question is and I would try to address it. And the other approach is to write it down, okay? You, you, you write down in your own notes. It's like, not sure about blah, 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 okay? Put a quite big question mark. Or if you have my modules printed out, Highlight it, okay? Put a big question mark next to it. So when you're home over a long weekend, you look through all of those question marks. It's like, okay, now that I have time, let me try to resolve what I didn't quite get in class for this little thing here, okay? Um, in addition to the question mark, you can also just jot down the time and the date because that will tell you which video to go to and approximately how much into the video you need to go to at least listen to the instruction or the whatever, you know, whatever, the way I presented the information. So all of those are ways to proceed when you go like, I'm for the most part getting this, but I'm, there's, there's a little bit of a gnawing feeling. Um, and uh, that's how you can proceed with that. If there's one superpower that I possess, what do you think that is? I did say if, which means you know, if I may not have any superpower, but if, if, there's a superpower that I know that I have. What do you think it is? Recordings. <laughs> That's a superpower of OBS, open OBS, open broadcasting system. I think. Software. Software. I think it's software. Okay. Yeah, but that's the superpower of OBS. Um, making tech work first try. <laughs> no. My only superpower is. I usually know what I do not know, especially in a class you know, setting when I'm reading something that's technical. Uh, when I don't understand something, it it I get I get really bothered by it. I know it doesn't sound like a superpower, right? You know, just knowing what you really do not know. Trust me, it it's really helpful when you're taking classes. All right. And then we can proceed. We can now proceed and go back to where we left off. Let me see where that is. All right, I think this is where we, this is it, okay? Filtering what the predicate applies to. In other words, hey, there are a lot of things in the universe that I, that I really don't care about. I only care about things that are in the set X. This is how we do it, okay? You know. So there's a whole discussion here that I recommend to you to read through but it's basically just a written form of what I said earlier. But I think the takeaway here, which is not in the notes here, is looking at there exists as a gigantic or, and looking at for all as a gigantic conjunction. Okay, that will 
really help you understand any of those concepts. Okay. Well, I do have a question. What if the ARC CIS department has no faculty member? What if we all quit at the same time because the industry is paying a lot better? Wait, they're already paying a lot better. There's no if then. <laughs> okay, so what if the set is empty? Okay, let, let, me, let me write it out so that we can look at this and then we can try to think about it, okay? So I am asking, okay, I'll give you a very extreme boundary case in this case, okay? So I am defining P of X is simply true, okay? That's an easy one. Throw any X at me, I'm just gonna answer yes. But tech, yes. Is that yes? Okay, so P of X returns a constant of true. Okay, it doesn't even matter what you throw at it. So now, I also define set A to be empty. Okay, A is an empty set. So now, I'm asking you, what do you think of this? For all x in A, P of x, oh, okay, I, I got the polarity flipped. That would be too easy. We'll make it a false, well, it doesn't really matter, actually. It really does not matter. We'll make it a true. So, how do we evaluate this one? What is it asking? It's asking for everything in an empty set, P of that is true. Huh. It's true. Hmm? It said it's true because there's nothing inside of the empty set. So therefore, so everything, everything is outside. Is outside exactly. Is whatever. Exactly. That is the actual, that's the correct reasoning. Because remember, this is the same thing as this. Right? Because, you know, this is just a syntactic kind of thing, you know, it makes it easier to read and easier to write. But in the second form, which means I'm referring to this one, since A is an empty set, that means every X in the entire universe is going to make X is an element of A false. Okay. If the left-hand side of the implication is false, the implication is true, so that means Oh, regardless of what I throw at it, this implication is going to be true. So the answer is, it is true. It doesn't even matter what, how P is defined, because I won't even get a chance to evaluate P, P of X. Is that making any sense? Okay, we good? All right. So we're going to do the same thing with the existential operator or the existential um, quantifier. So this time we have there exists x in A such that P of x is true. Okay. And A is still defined as an empty set, and P is still defined to be a constant of 1. So what do you think of this one? If you look at just this you know, statement, it's kind of like, hmm, isn't that a philosophical question? The answer is no, it is not a philosophical question. Because this is just a shorthand. Remember, this is a shorthand of something that is much longer. Well, not much longer, but a little bit longer. And that thing has no ambiguity, okay? Because this is the same thing as saying for everything in the entire universe, okay, is there at least one of those things that will satisfy this requirement, which is x is an element of A and P of x is true. So when you look at this statement inside the parentheses and the left-hand side of the conjunction, but you just told me that A is empty. If A is empty, X cannot possibly be an element of A, which means X is in A, it's going to be false. Well, so the conjunction is going to be false. And if the conjunction is always false, then the entire quantified statement is always going to be false. So these are the boundary cases that we have to really think about because when I give you a set and it has definite elements and whatnot, it's easy to look at and easy to think about what the answer should be. 
But the boundary case of when, what if the set is empty? Then you go like, huh, okay. So what do we do in that case? It's kind of like saying every green cat is mean. Okay, is that true or not? Let's think about that. Okay, let me just check whether you understand all this stuff or not. And then it also gives you a chance to exercise what you have just learned. And hopefully that will help to improve your understanding. So the statement is, um, okay, so I, I first of all say that there are no, okay, that would be giving away the answer. Every green cat is a mean cat. Okay, is that true or not? Is that statement true or not? Every, there are no green cats, okay? Very good. So it basically reverts back to this condition because the set A is empty. The set of green cats is an empty set. So when I say every green cat, which is using the universal qualifier, that's why we are using this guy and not this guy. So that means the quantified statement is actually true. Every green cat is a mean cat is a true statement. Are we doing okay so far with that? Because as much as it sounds like a philosophical thing or a literature thing, it is not. This is like, this is as rigid as it can get, okay, because of the way we define the operators. Are we still doing okay? Could you repeat that again? The average green cat, like why is it true again? Because there are no green cats, so all of the cats that are green are mean. Because of that. Because the set of green cats is an empty set. So to say that every green cat is mean is to say for all cat in the set of green cats, X is mean. Um, have you ever taken like a, uh, a what sort of class is there? Have you ever taken a drama class here? Okay, so you passed all of your drama classes that you've taken. Yes. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yep. Yep. That's a good example. <laughs> it's, I know it is counterintuitive. Counterintuitive. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, no. No need to be sorry. I welcome questions. Okay. So, yeah. I think I'm understanding it, but also, wouldn't it also be possible for it to have its fault as well because there are no sets? Well, there is a set. The set is empty. Well, I mean, because it's an empty set. It is an empty set, but the. Yeah. The trick to answer this question with certainty is to go back to the definition. And in this case, the definition refers to the implication here. Because once we look at the implication, then we can see, oh, if A is empty, then X is an element of A has to be false. If the left-hand side or the precedent of implication is false, the implication is true. So that means regardless of what thing you pick out of the entire universe, the devaluation of this expression here is going to be true. So this is also an illustration of why it is important to keep track of the definitions. Because you know, when we think about implication or when we think about every and we think about you know, at least one, we have our own intuitive understanding of those particular concepts. But in mathematics, it's not really, you know, there's no debate over, you know, should it be this way or should it be this way? Because the definition is supposed to be extremely precise. There's only one way to interpret and there's only one answer. I know that is not a great way of looking at life, but in a math class, that's the way it is. Yes? So I understand the definition of Why is this important in computer science? No, like, why is it true? Like, um, why is X is false and the whole case is true? Like, why? I don't understand. Like, why? 
because it boils down to true or true, excuse me, and true, and true, and true, and true, and true. This is when x binds to one thing in the universe. This is when x binds to another thing in the universe. This is when x binds to yet another thing in the universe. Whatever x binds to, this part of the statement is always true. And so the conjunction of all of those truths is going to be true. I'm not sure whether that's helping or not. We do okay? All right. Yes? Uh, no, no. What's the point of uh, defining here that people would want to emphasize? Oh, just to make it so that, you know, yeah. so P of X needs to be defined. So I'm just picking something that's, that's absurd. It doesn't even matter how P of X is defined because we don't get to evaluate P of X. So defining P of X as true or defining P of X as false doesn't even matter. Yes, go ahead. I just want to make sure we're understanding it. Uh, does this say like all the green cat, green cats are mean? Every, if it is every green cat is a mean cat. So in that case, your P of X is X is mean, and then the set A is going to be the set of all green cats, which is empty. So we boil down to exactly the same scenario that we have uh, at the upper half of this slide here, you know, meaning this portion here. Yep. So if you were to actually uh, apply this, uh, the meaning of P of X as a function, oh, uh, would it always would it always have to align with uh, the actual output of one or zero versus what uh, it's actually syntactically trying to? It has to be a it, a predicate has to return true or false. So p of x you know, has to return true or false. Okay, because otherwise I, if the operator is not defined. Because if p of x returns something other than true or false. I cannot, I cannot tell you what is the conjunction of that thing. Because conjunction is applicable only to Boolean values, right? So that restricts me to P of X has to be a Boolean. And that's also your kind of the definition of a predicate is it is a function that returns a Boolean value. Would there be a case where you, you would uh, invest another predicate with Say that one more time. You can define a predicate using other predicates, yes. It can even be recursive, but it still has to return true or false. A predicate is a function. Can you call a function when you are evaluating another function? Can you, when you're defining a function, can it refer to another function? Can it reference another function? Yeah. Yep, that's it. A predicate is really just a fancy word for a function that has a return type of a Boolean. All right, so are we doing okay so far with quantifiers? Okay, all right. So if you have to write down something because, you know, okay, I'm not quite sure about that, you know, just write it down, okay, you know, and I have my office hour. My office hour is half an hour before the class starts. So it is from... Uh, one thirty to 2.30, so you just have to arrive on campus a little bit early and just you know, stop by my office and we can talk about the topics for this class. Um, all right, shall we move on? These things will be used, okay, you know, all the way to the end of this semester, okay, so a lot of things, we are just building up the vocabulary of the things that really does matter for this class. So it is very important to get all of this stuff here. You have understood, not just memorized, okay, but really, really, really understood. Yes. Okay, there's another question about information that's presented, but there are bunch of assignment opportunities in the future. Um. Yes, I can make it due later. So don't worry if you. I want to make it due tonight because I want you guys to do it. You know, because you know, if I make it due uh, next Wednesday, most people will start next Tuesday. <laughs> and this particular homework assignment is about the notation 
and I want people to do it first because without knowing the symbols and understanding how what the symbols means, it's really hard to move on in this class. And that's why I want people to kind of just give it a push, get it done before midnight tonight and uh, be done with it. But thank you for reminding me to mention it because if you did not mention it, I would have forgotten. All right, so the homework assignment he is referring to is um, sex notation self-assessment and when you click on it it will tell you there's no access code okay for those of you who took CISP 310 with me and there's an infinite number of attempts and it is all multiple choice okay so would I recommend people just to kind of go hey, through hey, the, hey. the I call it the infinite monkey approach <laughs> That would totally defeat the purpose of the so-called homework assignment. It's only three points, okay? It doesn't take you a whole lot of time. If you run out of time, okay, you start the homework assignment at 11.55, okay? And then you need to go to the bathroom, and then you go like, oh, I don't have time. Okay, fine, go for the infinite monkey approach. But that would defeat the purpose of the homework assignment, okay? The, the purpose is to get you guys to think about the notation. Okay, which is really important in this class. But thank you for reminding me because I totally forgot. Yes? yes um, it's, um, when you change the due date, if um, someone has already done it, do they have to do it again? Nope. Okay. Nope. It and just, I, I it just it allows people more time to do it. Okay. And I'm tempted not to change the due date. <laughs> <clears throat> so the due date is midnight tonight. Uh, there are only three questions. For those of you who are thinking, oh, there has to be some really, really tricky question and mm -hmm. difficult to, to parse, these are the questions, okay? Uh, what is blah, 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 and five choices here. What is, uh, which one of the following cannot be a member of set C, and C is described by this statement here. And then the last one is kind of the same thing with a very small but important twist to it, okay? But once again, it's multiple choice, it will keep the highest score, and as long as you submit an attempt you know, before it's due, you know you can do it as many times as you want. And it remains to be the same three questions, by the way, because in some of my other classes, I'm nasty because you know every time you retry something, it gives you a different question. <laughs> so this one is designed to be easy, you know, for you guys to just kind of go in, do it, you know, and you know, so that you have some form of exercise and practice. All righty. Hmm? Say again? What? It's the Cartesian product. See, this is, it's, it's working already. <laughs> because we talked about it. It is working already. You're, you're already, you guys are, I mean, you don't have to tell me anything, but it's already working because you, know, you have to think about it. You have to go like, what is this symbol? Have we even talked about this? Yes. <laughs> the answer is P of X, yes. But what about yes? Do I? Yes. <laughs> Can we postpone the due date? No. <laughs> I caught that one. Yes. All right, so it won't take you a whole lot of time, okay? It, it, it really should not. Okay, that may not work if it doesn't show you the correct answer. So the best way to do it, if you were to use the infinite monkey approach, is to do A for the first question, just go through all five options, find out which one is the correct one, then you move on to the second one and do the same thing. Because if you just do AAA and it, all it returns is a score like one, you don't know which two you got wrong. It does tell you which ones you got wrong. I can program it so it does not. Uh, <laughs> so it's A, B, A, 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 B, A, A, C. So you want just A, B, C, D, E, figure out what is the correct one for the first question, and then move on to the second one. Yes. Why are you cheating? It's not cheating. It's trial and error. Well, okay, that by itself is an application of critical thinking. I'm just applying critical thinking so that I don't have to do critical thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
But in real life, you know, you don't have an option, right? You know, you you're given a new, you you you're given a programming task, and it's using a new programming language. There's no way to cheat in life. You can only do it up to a certain point. So I'm just you know, applying critical thinking. I am very good at circumventing stuff, even though I do not encourage people to do that. I do it as a challenge. It's like, can I circumvent blah blah blah? Okay, doesn't mean that I would actually do it because you know I just want to see where are the loopholes. Is there a flaw in the description? Circumvent the Pentagon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the consequence of that is is a little bit too much. Because you might end up you know, being a mandatory employee of the Pentagon, <laughs> or hostage or prisoner. It depends. It's just choice of words. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna take roll. You know, we'll take a kind of short break here, and I'll just go ahead and take roll. And the roll taking thing is oh, I don't even have it set up yet. That's okay. It's easy to do. We don't need to do taking. You could just say that everyone's here. <laughs> well, I'm just curious, you know, whether people are here or not. So I'm gonna do it, and we'll do this after uh, self-assessment. Okay, so talking, you won't be able to see it just yet, and even if you see it, you won't be able to do it because the due date is wrong. So let me refresh and see if it's done. Nope, not yet. Oh, there we go. And you cannot do it even though you can see it because the due date is in the past unless you have a time machine. So we'll go ahead and fix this. Three zero. And also fix the due date because that is what I need to do. <laughs> okay, what should I use as the passcode today? Mean cats. Hey. August 30th, and we'll set the time to the end of today's class. Okay, so people who just walk in will still be able to do it. Yay. Just in time. Just in time. J-I-T. All right, so refresh, and you should be able to get in. And then the access access code is mean cats, one word, all lowercase. Yes, I got it. Yes. I really cannot imagine teaching this class online and asynchronous. Asynchronous, meaning there's no you know. Live interaction. All right. So now we're going to go back and talk about set notations again, but this time we're going to do it using quantifiers. So we are reapplying what we just talked about, and we'll see how. Do you guys want to go back to the big operators? Maybe not. Oh. How many people feel comfortable with recursive definitions? All right. Um, have you taken CISP 430 prior to this class? Okay. Question? Oh, I'm saying I have. Oh, you have. Okay, so do you feel comfortable with uh, recursion? I was reading a book about recursion once, probably not forever. Well, recursion is actually a very simple concept, okay? Because recursion basically boils down to, can I express the solution of a bigger problem as one little thing that applies to one or a few things and recast the remaining portion of the problem as in the same nature as the problem that I need to solve, okay? Um, so we'll talk about recursion you know, in more details in this class too. And that's why this class has a co-requisite of CISP 430, because these two classes really kind of go hand in hand. 
or you can take 431st, you know, that also works really well. All right, so we're now getting into um, you know, set theory or set notations. It's more like using quantifiers. So we'll define you know, equality. And, okay, I'm just jumping to the notation here. So this one says, you know, if X and Y are both sets, then we can define X to be the same as Y, if and only if, for all E in X, E is in Y, and for all E in Y, E is also in X. Okay, does that matter? Does that make sense to you? The alternative is also, you know, in a more concise way, you can also say, you know, X equals Y, if X is a set, Y is also a set, then X equals Y if and only if, for all E, E in X, if and only if E is in Y. That's, do you see the equivalence between these two definitions? One is more wordy, it's kind of like, okay, we have one quantified statement just for things in X, and then we have another quantified statement for things in Y, and then this one here is like saying, oh, grab anything in the entire universe. Okay, grab everything in the entire universe. That thing is either in X and Y at the same time, or they are missing. It's missing from X and Y at the same time. That's all I care. Okay, it can be missing, it can be there. It's just that if it is missing from X, it should be missing from Y too. If it is in Y, it should be in X and so on and so forth. There are four cases that we need to consider in that case. So that's using quantifiers. And then we also have the notation of E is a set such as, it is a set of elements X such that P of X is true. Okay, that's how we read this particular statement. But using the universal quantifier, we can now say for everything in the entire universe, okay, for each thing X in the entire universe, X is an element of E if and only if P of X is true. So now that is actually saying exactly the same thing. We evaluate every single thing in the entire universe, but if that thing is in E, we better make sure that P of X is true. But the opposite is true as well. If something makes P of X true, we better make sure it's also in E. So it goes in both directions, and hence the symbol is a bi-direction arrow. All right, and then the empty set is uh, can be defined. I know this is really silly. Um, how do we know that S is an empty set? It is not the case that there's at least one thing in the, in, in the universe such that that thing is, a, is an element of S. That is a really long way to say S is an empty set. But it still makes sense, okay? So the point is not so much whether this is the best way of saying something, it is can you make a connection between that statement, the statement where the mouse cursor is on, with the concept of an empty set. If you're going like, yep, yeah, that makes sense to me, I know all the symbols, I know what the expression means, and it, yes, it is consistent with what we understand about an empty set, great, okay? That means you're making connections. Um, we have intersection and union. So with an intersection, we can do it like this. Uh, for everything X, for everything X in the entire universe, X is an element of the intersection between A and B, if and only if X is in A and X is in B. You go like, isn't that the same thing that we that we saw earlier in two two classes ago? The answer is almost, because two classes ago we did not say for all. This part was missing from before. Now without that for all, you could have easily said. Oh, do we just need one thing in the entire universe? And if that one thing can be found in both A and B, then you know um, that's the only requirement you know, for A an intersecting with B. It can have just that one single element, and we don't care about the rest. No, no, it's a universal quantifier. So everything that meet the requirement of in A and in B, they all have to be in the intersection, but the intersection cannot contain additional stuff either. Um, union is about the same thing, and you can also see the the pattern because you know the union, uh, the intersection, is related to conjunction. They both have an open end at the bottom, and then when you are looking at union, 
it is uh, related to disjunction, and they both have the opening on top. So these symbols are not just randomly picked. Okay, they act. There's a certain pattern to these things. Uh, Cartesian product is kind of the same thing. You know, all we all I did here is to say for all x in A and for all y in B, and then the rest is exactly the same as what we had before. This part, portion here. So this part here, there are two parts to the conjunction. The left hand side of the conjunction is saying for everything in x and everything in y, the two tuple, you know, uh, x y, you know, has to be an element of the Cartesian product. But without the second part of the conjunction, it does not say that the Cartesian product cannot contain additional stuff. Is that okay? Because if you just look at the left hand side of the conjunction, it is defining mandatory membership of things. But it doesn't say anything about can we have some optional stuff, you know, that we can kind of sneak into the Cartesian product? It doesn't say anything about that. It can contain some additional stuff. The right hand side of the conjunction, on the other hand, restricts, okay, and say that everything that you find in the Cartesian product has to be a two tuple, where the first item has to come from the set A, and the second item has to come from the set B. But the problem with only having the right-hand side is it doesn't say anything about the completeness of the Cartesian product. In other words, I can just pick one thing from A, pick one thing from B, and say, oh, according to this, we'll just say that that is the one thing in the Cartesian product. Are we doing okay so far with that statement? Okay, let's read that one more time. This one says, okay, the second part of the conjunction says, for all element x, y in A Cartesian product with B, x has to be found in A and y has to be found in B. It doesn't say that it has to be complete. In other words, if A is 1, 2, B is A, B, I can say if I just look at the right-hand side of the conjunction, which is this portion here, I can now say, oh, a Cartesian product with B only has um, one A. It would meet this requirement on the right-hand side, but it would fail the requirement on the left-hand side. So that's why the conjunction is actually important, because one allows additional stuff, but it includes everything that should be there. The other one excludes you know, all the additional stuff, but it doesn't say what makes it complete. So that's why both of those are important. And then we have the subset operation. So A is a subset of B if and only if everything in A is also in B. Okay, that's an easy way to look at it. And then A is a proper subset of B is A is a subset of B and there exists X in B that is not in A. So you know, in, a, in a certain way, it, it actually makes more sense. It's actually more intuitive to understand um, once you get used to the symbols. And these symbols will be used throughout this entire semester. So it is very important to have a thorough understanding and familiarity of the symbols, you know, because you know, we stack up on top of all of these things. All right, so we are running out of time. Have a nice long weekend. Do not come to class on Monday because the campus will be closed. So enjoy your long weekend and pound these definitions and symbols into your head. And don't forget the homework assignment that's due midnight today. It's not graded. Huh? It's automatically graded. No, I'm saying it doesn't affect our score. Um, it does not. That is correct. I have draw understanding that it's okay. a false statement that called green cat um, me. Mm -hmm. If there's no green cat, then the statement is true. Right? If there's no, okay. So the set of green cats is an empty set. Right. So, so nothing, a, nothing can be a member of that set. Right. So X is a member of A, has to be false. Yeah. Yeah, I get that. But yeah. And then the whole thing will be true. Yes. As a whole. I mean, yes. Logically, that makes sense because there's no green cat then how does it make But you go by the definition of the implication yeah, operator. Yeah, I get it. Because it's like, I cannot understand the definition. 
you cannot understand the definition. Do you yeah. know where to find the definition? Yeah, I got in my like I use the truth table. Yeah. yeah. Okay, show me the truth table of so, implication. So when it's false, it's only gonna be true. Yes. Okay. And then I, I use a statement that the green has, and that it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, according to this, yeah, it makes sense, but like I don't. But that is the whole point. Don't go by your intuition. Go by the definitions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because, I'm like, it's that kind of that was that was the yes that was intentionally confusing you know and you know, it was intentional that when you read the statement right. you know all green cats are mean cats when you just read the statement you go like can it be true or can it be false but the whole point is don't go by your intuition do okay. not. Do not treat this class as a philosophy <laughs> class, right? Yeah. It is not English literature either. This is a logic class. So okay. you go back to the definition. Okay. Is that <laughs> okay? I was thinking the whole time, like, it makes sense. <laughs> okay, that was gotcha. intentional. I do that a lot in my classes. I try to in introduce confusion whenever it's possible. All right. Thank you. Because in confusion, we find clarity. I did the thing that you told us to do, where like once mm -hmm. we understand, that's something to kind of put it in our own words to make sure we're actually doing it right. Yeah. So what I did, I don't. I just want to make sure I had my understanding of pieces right. For this, I put at least one thing in the universe is part of A and makes P of X true. That's right. And then the other one is all things that are in the universe that are in A make P of X true. That are also yes. All things in the universe, the universe that are in A. Mm -hmm. So if there's some, like if there's nothing in A, mm -hmm. then it automatically that statement would be true, true. Yep. because there's nothing in A to check if P of X would be true, that which is makes the statement true. Well, to be more exact, yeah. it makes the element of expression mm -hmm. true, uh, false. Sorry, it makes that false. Yeah. So because it's on the left hand side of the implication, mm -hmm. according to the truth table of yeah. implication, the implication itself is going to be true. Yeah. And since that is applicable to everything in the universe because the set is empty, mm -hmm. now the whole the whole conjunction becomes true okay. because you're basically looking at true and true and true and true and true and true. You know, so yeah. the whole thing becomes true. Cool. Okay, yeah. I think I think I got it. Then. <laughs> I, I like the way you're writing your notes. You're know, putting, you know, basically using your own words to describe it. Yeah. yeah, I I I'm finding that I think the best way to do notes for me in this class is just to make like.